My name is Jason. My name is Tom. And this is Fear of a Black Dragon, an old school role playing game podcast. And in this episode, you're indestructible as we celebrate our golden 50th episode anniversary. Our first segment is a basic crawl. Fear of a Black Dragon is a podcast about fantasy modules and setting books, particularly those coming out of the OSR movement. Each episode focuses on a single book and is divided into three parts, the basic crawl, the expert delve, and the companion adventures. It is presented by Jason Cordova and Tom McGrenery, with production by Paul Edson, Luke Quaid, and Rich Rogers. Listeners, this is the 50th episode of Fear of a Black Dragon, and so today we are going to we're going to reflect a little bit on the show. Tom and I are going to talk about our experience with the show and give you some insight into our into our minds, uh, <laughs> the, the crazy thinking that goes into the show. And uh, we're also going to be taking some questions or answering some questions that were posed to us on the Gauntlet forums. So yeah, a little bit of a format change, but you know, it's a special episode. Let's do it. Yeah. I mean, if you thought some of our segments were self-indulgent, strap in for an entire episode of that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> Precisely. Well, okay, so I thought it'd be fun to just kind of start with doing Fear of a Black Dragon. Like, how has that been for you, Tom? Like, we've done 50 episodes. Presumably it has, you know, had an effect on how we view games and play games. Um, What are your thoughts? I have found that through the need to run and play things for Fear of a Black Dragon, that it's, it's kind of pushed me into trying things out or maybe taking things at face value that I otherwise might not have done. You know, like how every game book as soon as it comes out people are immediately thinking of ways to hack it for their favorite like my little pony setting or something right yeah uh, without even playing it once but because i I like felt this compulsion to like do things raw or like try and at least have a go at the thing that was presented to me on the page i found myself doing stuff like i think ordinarily i would have instantly adapted or used a different system or done differently and then there's this quote i remember from the jazz violinist stefan grappelli and he used to say i'm famous for like my improvisation and kind of wild crazy jazz stuff but i always play the song through once as it's written on the sheet music out of respect for the composer and i've I've found myself kind of doing the gaming version of that you know like uh giving it a go and yeah maybe it's not going to work out the way i feel like is a good thing and it's brought me to some good gaming experiences that i basically i i guess i've learned to trust people more in the sense of like taking what they present and like giving them the benefit of the doubt and actually doing what it says which sounds absolutely childish now that i say it out loud but i think it's a thing that we (laughs) we would do you know you go through oh yeah i'm not going to use that rule i'm I'm definitely not going to do that but actually you should give it a go because sometimes it surprises you well it's funny because it's like you're speaking to me directly because of the two of us i'm the one who doesn't do that right i think think that's why i feel more need to do it because otherwise you know I'm just like, I look at great big whole parts of the book and I'm like, nope, <laughs> not doing it. <laughs> Excise, cut, slice. But, you know, I think that's what makes the show work because I appreciate that you approach each book in a very like rules is written kind of way because I know I'm not going to. But I think like what you end up getting is this nice balance between I, I, th- I think we're able to present like a legitimate review of the module or the book that we're doing while not having it be like a formulaic review show you know i think that like our sort of mixed approaches help like bring that to the fore like you get like a nice comprehensive look at the module you get to look at different ways of looking at it or you get get like insight into like you know how we like to tear things apart and dive into it and sometimes that means approaching it in a different way like i mean the whole kind of raison d'etre of the show is we want to have like a We want to present like, okay, the OSR through the view of like people who are maybe accustomed to more narrative type systems, or at least from my perspective. I think there's a balance there. I think the show would be a lot less interesting if it was like if we both just did whatever we wanted and kind of ignored RAW, or if we both did RAW. I think it would be as good. Definitely. I mean, although, of course, the trouble, the trouble with this whole format is that. It's been how long? And we're only on 50 episodes. It's so labor and time intensive because of our rule it about really how... It really is. I think, is it once, maybe twice? No, there's only one episode where neither of us have played it because that was a special competition exception, right? So, right. I mean, that so was, for uh, listeners... Because there's, the there's some Kingdom lack of clarity time. on this on the internet. So I'd like to I'd like to speak out now and say, okay, one of us has always... At least one of us has always played or right. run it. Frequently, we've both 
run and play. Like there are some episodes where we've both done different versions of the right. like, different, totally different groups several times. Other times, one of us has only had like one chance to run it. But yeah, and that's why it takes so long because you have to, mm-hmm. you know, you can't just flip through the book. I mean, okay, sometimes I just flip through the book if it's the one that Jason has run, and then <laughs> and then just ask him questions about it. <laughs> I do not. I read it page by page. No, I know. I know. Very, very oh, well, I say flip yeah. through. I do, I do. I read all the words. I'm just saying I don't like. Uh, <laughs> I'm not like dissecting it over a period of hours in the same way that you do when you're prepping for. For running that's a game fair. as well. Yeah. yeah, that's totally fair. Um, I mean, if you've seen what you... Jason, you've seen the notes, so definitely... <laughs> definitely. Oh my gosh. Yeah, yeah so it's really labour-intensive, but I think that's why it works, because we are putting the time in, and deliberately... I don't know about you, but I, if I run the same thing twice or play in it, get another chance to play in it, I do deliberately do it quite differently from the first time as an experiment, just I, to see, see what happens, you know? Yeah, no, that absolutely. I, I, I'm glad you bring up the labour-intensive part of it, because... I don't know if that's apparent to listeners or not. I don't think, um, I sometimes think that, I don't think it is. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure if it is because I think there are a lot of there. I mean, there are obviously lots of role playing game podcasts out there and lots of shows where they do reviews of things. And I don't think that often on other review spaces, whether that be a blog or another podcast or whatever, frequently it's just a review based off a read of the module and not actually playing it. And we make sure that with the exception of that one episode that at least one of us has always played it. And that is, it means that we can't put out episodes as frequently as we probably would like. I mean, Mm -hmm. because we just have a, you know, we can only do so many because we have, we have to run this stuff. And sometimes when we're in a groove, like I'm running one thing and Tom is running another thing so that we know we're going to have a couple of episodes that we can kind of get done. But, you know, it's funny. We, (laughs) we, people love to, give us five or six or seven suggestions of things they'd love to see us cover. And it's <laughs> yeah. like, yep, that'll be a year from now, maybe. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like if you're lucky. You know, it's, yeah, like it's not, it's just not that easy, right? It's just, no. it is very, very time intensive and labor intensive. I'll tell you what, some of these modules are, especially the older ones, are 150 pages, you know, with multiple columns of text. And yeah, uh, yeah. sometimes they're a little dry, <laughs> you know. And Or, uh, I mean, oh, just the extent of it. One of the reasons that I'm not producing new material as much is because I'm normally in two games per week. So, like, one of those, the one just mm-hmm. Saturdays, is generating, it's kind of generating content, as they say. Uh, but the other one, of course, is the monumental enemy within campaign for Warhammer. So we're pretty near the end of that now, but it's been going for a while. So yeah. the thing is, yeah. it, it wants to finally finish one of those sections. It produces like two episodes, but uh, it kind of, oh man. <laughs> yeah. And they're pretty big as well. So Jason has to read about 224 pages each time, it. Yeah. which he loves. I almost I almost didn't make it through, um, I can't remember the name How of it Behind anymore, the but... Throne, which is only part one that we're on as well. We still have to do part two of that, yeah. Uh, do we? Yeah. Oh, yeah, we do. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well... There we go. <laughs> There's one we can <laughs> put in the can for soon. Yeah, but but like reading through that was like. It, fortunately, we got to the the really good part of that module because I I don't love about half of that like as much as you do. But but the other half of that one was really strong, and so it kind of made it worth it. But um, yeah, it's a lot of reading. It's a lot yeah. of note taking. It's a lot of thinking. It's a lot of uh, planning sessions. Um, mm-hmm. And then of course, there's the editing side of it, which you and I don't have anything to do with. But um, you know, first Paul and then then Lou and now Rich. It's it's a lot of work. I mean, I think you can. I think you can hear it. Like the the level of quality that we go for. It's it's a lot, and that's uh, that's time consuming. Even a very very skilled editor will take like however much however long the episode is. A very skilled editor will still take about twice as long to edit the episode. Right? Like that's yeah. that's about typical. So, yeah. Um, something that I think has been really interesting about doing this show, and probably the most important thing for me, is it's helped me push past some hesitations i had with the osr sort of culturally speaking so i come from a story gamer background right that's my that's my thing that's what i'm known for that's what i do that's where i kind of made my reputation in the hobby and i have to tell you there were a couple of years where I had nothing but bad experiences with the OSR community. There were some actors, some bad actors, who I'm not going to say right now, but let's just say that there were some bad actors who, frankly, were a big turnoff. And I think a lot of people would probably be like, and indeed have been like, uh, forget it. I don't want anything to do with that scene because these people are clearly assholes or they're toxic. And I would have been within my rights to just discard the OSR as a role-playing game vector. But I chose not to because... 
you know, some of the things that I had read, I found genuinely inspiring and I thought they were very creative and I could, I could tell that there was a really awesome, active, creative uh, scene there. And so I had to find a way to interact with the OSR to where I could actually enjoy myself, uh, to where I could feel comfortable doing it. And so Fear of a Black Dragon gave me that. Like Fear of a Black Dragon was my way of doing that. If I did not have this opportunity to interact with the scene, I, I probably never would have. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I know what you mean. It's sort of, this is an ungamer friendly analogy, but it reminds you of some of the, there are, let's say, football clubs around the world who have uh, not, not the best fans in some sections. You know, like I'm thinking particularly of, okay, let's name names, Lazio with their far-right ultras and stuff. And I remember talking to someone who was a Lazio fan, and I didn't accuse them outright, but I was basically, my, my line was, how can you follow that club when they have literal fascists in the stands? And their response was, it's my club. I'm not letting the fascists have this club, okay? They don't get to <laughs> right, decide yeah. whether I, you know. And I was like, I mean, I don't think this is an entirely watertight argument because of some of the, some of the other activities on the pitch. But, like, that's kind of true, right? Like, it's not... It's not fair to let the bad guys keep all the good stuff. And so like being able to mine out and kind of pry apart this idea that OSR games and gaming has to be identified with this handful of people. Um, that's not really true. And I think that's one of the great things we've seen in OSR in recent years is that one of the kind of silver linings maybe of G plus disappearing is that it's moved from being this idea of a community to actually being a useful label. Like nowadays you can say, I'm playing this OSR-ish game. And although there's debate about oh, what does it mean, blah, blah, blah. It's a useful label. Like, people know what you mean now. People generally know what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, like, yeah. They'll probably ask you some follow-up questions about it. But yeah, specifically, if you say, yeah, I'm playing this OSR game, they're like, oh, okay, I get it, yeah. And um, that's probably the most useful thing that uh, a term like OSR can be. It can't stay as a, a particular group of people, no matter how big, for a long time. So, yeah, I don't know how much... Uh, effect no i don't think i don't think podcasts affect that at all really but uh for yeah for us i think it's been we've been present while that's been happening and you know you know in my opinion one of the hallmarks from my my then my perspective at least from my point of view at that time one of the hallmarks of the osr community to me was that there was this divide between osr gamers and story gamers and i think it was the same on the story gamer side too right like like it felt tribal it mm. felt like two groups of people who could not see eye to eye on like what gaming should be. And I think that there were bad actors on all sides as far as that goes. Right. Yeah. You know, in my opinion, I think fear of a black dragon, I think we can fairly say that fear of a black dragon helped start to change that conversation because we were so explicitly combining the idea of story games and story game thought with osr modules we were kind of viewing osr modules through a particular lens at least from my vantage point that's how i always approached it and you know the show one and any it's popular i mean listeners yeah. fear of black dragons a very popular podcast i feel like we were able to help change that conversation and now i see a lot of people on the osr scene who i consider to be voices or well-known people in that scene i see them talking about things that story gamers were talking about years ago and i see them like kind of taking that on i see story gamers backing osr kickstarters and embracing osr uh, design culture like i just i feel like that wasn't happening circa yeah that's true 20, 2013 to 2017 like i feel like that just was not happening and i was in a position to observe it when i approached tom about making this show that was part of my pitch. Part of my pitch was, I want to create a show where we can actively tear down that separation, where we can sort of ex like actively build a bridge between these two cultures, in addition to playing awesome modules and having fun talking about them and stuff. But I had like a sort of agenda. And so I'm, I'm happy and proud yeah, to say yeah, I yeah. think we did a good job. Yeah, I, I mean, I think in fairness, <laughs> I remember around that time I was uh, lurking or, I mean, if you remember uh, storygames.com and that place always took the attitude that, yeah, OSR stuff, there were loads of really long threads about old-fashioned D&D, like, but in a here's what my game is doing kind of way. This idea that it's all generating story games in a sense. And I think that was part of what I was thinking about when I when I signed up for this escapade. <laughs> because like that was a bit of a walled garden. Like I rarely posted there because it was that kind of place. But um, yeah, it, it felt to me like it was a promising avenue of inquiry. And indeed, over the, 
after years, it is literal years, of doing this podcast, I've gradually developed that sort of theory of when I'm doing uh, my own kind of bits of OSRE game or adventure design of this idea that it is generating a story, but it's, uh, it's the phrase I'm still failing to popularise, fantasy non-fiction. Right. And I've seen some similar discussion, I don't think necessarily inspired by our chats here, where people refer to it as like world games or the idea that it's, yeah, the story you're creating is, is based on things that are happening in a consistent fictional world as opposed to the genre-focused things in more narrative games. And that, I think, is the real value of both the OSR and story games in general, like sort of Forgeite-derived games, mm-hmm. is that they're both being quite intentional about what they're doing. In some cases, that's right. yeah. recreating the feel or action of old-school d d In narrative games, it's telling certain kinds of story structure as opposed to story setting. And in both cases, it was a reaction to your mid-90s to 2000s, fairly <laughs> generally bad box ticking. Yeah. Like yeah. Every time a new licensed game comes out, that's like from a, a mainstream design studio. I just think, hooray, it's another full color glossy catalog of all the vehicles that are in the TV show and they're going to be given stats based on basically nothing, just like eyeballing what happened on TV. And it won't be play tested very much, or if it is, they won't really pay any attention. I mean, let's face it, the 90s are what truly unite the clans. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's the threat of the 90s. And yeah, so the goals are actually quite similar. And uh, yeah, I think it's a shame that that wasn't really visible. But on the other hand, I guess it, this kind of thing often doesn't happen without at least a few charismatic, egocentric individuals. And they are the worst people for yeah, <laughs> like yeah. for sort of cultural interchanges in that sense. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I feel like it's it's all panning out more or less by now though i think so too yeah i mean my sense is that like it's everything is just in a much healthier space than it was a few years ago and that makes me really really happy because you're right i mean i subscribe to the sort of horseshoe theory of indie gaming where you have like sort of like forge the forge diaspora on one end and then you have the osr on the other end and while there's a lot of like stuff in the middle they're much closer to each other than they are Mm, ultimately like apart any other things you want to say about just generally speaking, like your experience with the show? There is there is something we, we should mention. And of course, that's um, that uh, Paul Edson, very sadly, uh, you know, he was our editor for, mm. is it, it was probably still most of the episodes because on account of I our incredibly slow production episodes. schedule yeah. from you and I, Jason. Yeah. And uh, I miss him. I, I'll tell you, I was this close to just stopping doing the podcast after he died. It was. Yeah. It was a challenging time. Uh, well, so listeners, uh, we actually, we've actually never talked about how the show came together. So mm-hmm. uh, listeners, I first became aware of Tom because Tom was a Tom was a guest on uh, our current editor's web program, Dr. Dr. Oh, yeah. Tom I was the interviewed, Frog. I was show. interviewed by a frog. <laughs> That's right, yeah. Yes, it was a little web show of a puppet frog that interviewed role-playing game designers. Um, Incredibly niche, as you might imagine. Uh, But it was fun. It was a funny, punny show. Anyway, I saw Tom on an episode of that. And I just remember thinking, like, you know, sometimes you just, like, watch someone or you listen to someone and you just think, oh, man, like, I really just connect. Like, I can feel, like, that there's a sort of... Uh, there's a connection there. I feel like that's one of my superpowers as a person. I'm very good at like evaluating like people's uh, character and worth, I guess, as it relates to me, wow. if that makes any sense. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> like I know how I'm going to relate to people like, inter- immediately. This is the first by, time I've heard this, like, by the way, listeners. This is all new to me as well. <laughs> what I'm basically saying is I could tell that like, I was like, oh, he seems like a really interesting person. I kind of like his vibe. and uh, And I think... I don't remember if there was anything in between, but at some point we started doing an actual play podcast of Monster of the Week. Uh, the Gauntlet used to produce this program called Comic Strip AP, and it was like a one-on-one uh, actual play. And so we did this Monster of the Week actual play where I was the GM and Tom played... Oh gosh, what was the character's name, Tom? Oh, uh, Robert something. He was a daring jewel thief in the mold of uh, Harry Grant. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, basically. Yeah, yeah. It, it, we did this sort of like kind of like 1950s Cary Grantish like Monster of the Week campaign, and uh, it was really really good. It was really fun. Like we were really clicking, and so I think Tom, I think we were both like kind of anxious to like work on something else together, yeah, basically. Yeah, yeah. And so when I had the idea for Fear of a Black Dragon, I, I made the pitch, and you know, and Paul was right there at the beginning because. Paul knew that I was kind of tossing this idea around. And so he 
started to kind of like give me his ideas and started to like kind of chime in about it with me on direct message. And I was like, well, you know what? We need an editor. Like, do you want to edit the show? And Rich Rogers, our current editor, kind of showed Paul the ropes of like editing podcasts. And that's how it started. And for a long time, the show was the three of us. Tom and I were the hosts, but all three of us like sort of shaped it. And um, and so when Paul passed away, it was it was challenging. It was hard. It was a really, really hard moment. Yeah, it was tough. I mean, like it was a really challenging moment, not just for the show, but for the whole gauntlet, because Paul was a really big part of like everything yeah, we did yeah. in the community. So, yeah, I mean, truth be told, one of my motivations for keeping going was I felt that Paul would be very angry with me if I just gave up on this whole thing after all that effort. So, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah <laughs> so, sure. uh, yeah, it's a there's that. But um, well, and, yeah. you know, we, we were lucky that that Lou stepped in and you know helped us out. It all worked out in the end, but uh, it, was def- it was definitely challenging. I don't think it was ever challenging. From like the production of the show was never really in danger because we have a good process. But I think it was just a sort of emotional, absolutely, yeah, challenge, <laughs> right? Like you know, it was just hard. Yeah, yeah. So, but yeah, I, I, do, I do want people to know that, uh, particularly in terms of yeah, creating the podcast and so on. Yeah, we couldn't have done this without Paul. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I just want everyone to be aware of that because it's easy to focus on on just the talking voices, but actually, yeah, uh, for, yeah but yeah, Rich and, and Lou, and uh, and particularly in in those first many episodes, Paul Edson, key to the process. Indeed, indeed. Well, with that. Why don't we go to the chain lightning round? Uh, You better go first because you wrote down more. (laughs) I do have more. On the episode for Tales of the Scarecrow, the expert delve, where we talk about selling horror at the table. Loved that. Um, That's a favorite topic of mine generally. And I think we did a really nice job there. I like the expert delve in episode one. We really set out as we meant to go on because it was about adapting the adventure to other times and systems with an emphasis on bringing out the themes of the module, which is, I mean, <laughs> like, it's, that's the whole podcast encapsulated, basically. On the episode for Operation Unfathomable, the expert delve where we talked about good characterizations. I love that episode. I think it's the kind of topic that a lot of similar shows don't talk about. And, uh, and I also think that just good characterization is something as a general matter we don't emphasize enough in the hobby. Generally speaking, I always think our most successful delves, uh, the ones that are most satisfying to me are the ones where they're specifically about some tricky or problematic part of the module we're discussing that then conveniently happens to extrapolate out to something else. So uh, I think Death on the Right Part 2, the thing about meeting the villains early in a in an adventure, that was a very good example. Or talking about journeys and travel in uh, Ultraviolet Grasslands, I thought was uh, also in that category. I love the conversation that we had about nautical themes and seafaring adventures for Sinister Secret of Salt Marsh. I think that's most listeners' favorite expert delve too, <laughs> but I really love it. Okay, I have, a, I have a bonus one related to that, which is uh, something you could never enjoy, listeners, because I enjoyed uh, hearing off mic uh, Jason's anecdotes about being in the Navy. <laughs> yes, those, those will never, ever they be never recorded be. <laughs> medium. No. Uh, I have a bonus one as well. The conversation we had on Sailors of the Starless Sea about how to give emotional depth and complexity to a funnel adventure. I <laughs> love that conversation <laughs> because it is the it is the day blue ultra of us being on our bullshit. And like it. Yeah, it's so good. Let's go to the expert. Delve. OK. We asked listeners for questions and they gave us some. So here we go. Wait, was that your intro? <laughs> yeah, that's it. What? What do you want? Oh, oh it, was, it was so fast. I was like, <laughs> oh, you yeah, waited yeah, 0.5 seconds. <laughs> Should we do it in order? I guess we might as well, right? I mean... Yeah, listener questions. So first of all, a number of people posed what is essentially the same question, I think. They're basically this. The OSR has gone through big changes over the last few years. And this this particular phrasing of the question is, is from our friends at Redmond Roleplaying. Between the huge successes, controversies, Google Plus disappearing, and so forth, can you reflect a bit on the past and bring up your crystal ball to try to predict the future of the movement? Lots of people had questions like this. Like, basically, where do we see the OSR going? Thoughts, Tom? Well, first of all, uh, this kind of question is always terrible um, because, <laughs> no, it's pure <laughs> luck as to whether you'd be right or not. Let me see. I mean, there are things that we already see happening i mean at a quite prosaic level uh, just ex- exploring settings and themes beyond fantasy and science fiction adventure games like um a friend of mine a while back said can osr do anything other than D or traveler and i was like i yes 
but and I think at the moment we're seeing that in the kind of primitive early stages where you essentially just kind of reskin your D and D party to be soldiers in World War Two or nineteen twenties gangsters. We have started seeing a little bit where, especially in the OSR genre, tends to come through random encounter tables, and I've started to see that a lot more kind of more urban picker esque adventures, like in statues, <laughs> or right, yeah. yeah, more work in in that sense to take something that's still an OSRE experience, but applied differently. God, that sounds vague. But uh, yeah, I think that's that's going to happen more as people get more adventurous with what they're doing. The thing that I see that's most interesting kind of on the horizon is basically like kind of getting out of the dungeon, having an OSR that's not just a dungeon crawl, but like explores other kinds of adventure, other kinds of scenarios. Like you said, the urban picaresque sort of story is a great example. That's one thing. I think another thing is the continued blending and melding of um, narrativist or story game techniques with OSR techniques. I think that's pretty fascinating. We have some of these newer systems that are very, very streamlined and don't have the same approach to like kind of like combat, like some of the more traditional sort of like OSR systems do. I think that's a very interesting thing. Kind of a narrow thing that I think is worth keeping an eye on is I think that that sort of gross grind housey black metal lane that lamentations of the flame princess used to kind of own is wide open now because lamentations has kind of shot themselves in the foot in so many ways and i I feel like that's wide open right now Mm. and i'm going to be really interested to see like who grabs that i I, you can kind of see it already like i think the morkborg people is kind of there we'll see that could be yeah yeah morkborg is Mm. kind of getting there i think you can see a lot of that like i and i i think that's fascinating because i'm ready for that because i love that i mean i i I like the substance of lamentations of the flame princess like adventures but i'm finding it harder and harder and harder every (laughs) passing month yeah uh, to stay on board with them yeah (laughs) yeah and so i'm ready for someone else to sort of pick up those reins yeah oh another thing i think that there has been a lot more critical thinking about colonialist themes in fantasy gaming and i'm curious to see if the osr continues to sort of explore this idea of discarding those themes or being critical yeah or them, uh, although i think we've seen a few things like that explore colonial but not colonialist things which is is a, another thing as well so that's yeah but you're right like it's that thing of thinking more carefully and like yeah reconstructing from the base up if that makes sense like of what the the old school modules tend to be about and and again as we get further out of the dungeon i think that will change more but yeah i mean this is all hopelessly vague because we, we don't know do we jason <laughs> just, no, we, don't, yeah. we just don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Our friend Jesse Ross, uh, the author of Trophy, uh, had a few questions for us. Yeah. Shall I ask the one to you? Yeah, okay. So uh, please do, yeah. Uh, Jesse asks Jason, what is your favorite nautical themed adventure that you've run or played? My answer, Jesse, is none. Uh, I have no answer here. Um, I have not played in any that I can remember. And I have not run any fantasy nautical adventures that I can recall with any. Yeah, fondness. this is a, this is a great question. Yeah, I was thinking about this when I saw well when I saw your note. Right, uh, obviously I've run Secret Sinister Secret Salt Marsh, which turned into a nautical adventure by mistake, but that's not in but the it's module not on the page. Yeah. There is, there's yeah. no really actually seafaring like iconic seafaring module. That's a that's a and it seems like there should be like something like Treasure Island. Yeah. Or. Uh, Monkey Island, what have you say? So, yeah, hmm. Interesting. There's really not, is there? It, I, I really thought about it. I was like, well, I just I got to something, right? You would think. But, you know. <laughs> right, yeah. yeah, I can name I can name like ten different story games that handle the theme very well, but that's not what he asked. Yeah, that's not a question. I'll tell you what I want there. What I want, if some intrepid author is this going to be about whaling? <laughs> it is. Uh, kind of. <laughs> yes. Uh, what I want <laughs> is I want a module that is a shipboard mystery. That's what ah. I want. I played the video game Return of the Oberdin, which is fabulous, by the way, and I want the fantasy OSR version of Return of the Oberdin. I think that shipboard settings. I love them so much because they are not just because I have like a sort of personal connection to that environment, but also I just feel like you have a group of people who depend on each other for their lives, but also they're in a very confined space and you have the bitterness and the rivalries and the pettiness, like that wonderful toxic mix. Like it's so good. And I want to see the, Scenic Dunsmith is a great example of like a sort of more mystery focused OSR thing. And I would love to see something like that, but like on a poor ship. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. That'd be pretty cool. 
Tom, another question from Jesse, have you noticed any regional gaming trends across the audiences that you interact with, uh, meaning the UK, Brazil, Hong Kong? Yeah, okay, so I don't really interact with the UK gaming scene at all, so I would discard that part of the question. In terms of Anglophone role-playing, yeah, like what you see on the internet, that's that's what I get. Yeah, all right, uh, Hong Kong is, well, like, like everywhere, it's, it's almost all D&D 5e. What's interesting here, though, is that Board game cafes are a big thing, but they're terrible for role playing. So um, there tend to be just kind of a lot of meetup groups that weirdly are kind of locked in for incredibly long running campaigns. So half of them are like, oh, can you make it to this thing on Thursday night? By the way, no new players. I don't know why they're even listed on meetup, but uh, there they are. And then there are a few kind of open groups around. But yeah, there's not that much visibility i would say on rpgs in hong kong like if you wanted to join a group it would be relatively difficult although if you're stopping by i and a group of uh, like-minded individuals have been running open table games on saturdays for i think about three years now it's crazy at a pret manger right <laughs> uh, it is at a pret manger yeah they're, they're very hospitable like we used to have another place where they kind of they revamped into a sit down semi like kind of fine dining restaurant and one, one saturday <laughs> we turned up and they're like table for how many and we went what uh, so <laughs> we had to move on for that place and then we had like we basically kept going around different cafes in central there was one that was like pretty good but around 2 30 p.m they'd always have a jazz trio who were great but had lots of bongo solos and when you're doing night witches <laughs> that's not the atmosphere so like yeah so uh, that's good one short saturdays if you want to join us and then brazil i would say has a few interesting things happening one these guys love a character sheet design. I mean, the graphic design on Brazilian game character sheets for existing games or for new ones is amazing. And it's it's often what <laughs> pulls you into the thing. You just look at the sheet and go, this is great. <laughs> There's an interesting thing, which I think has been observed in other places, like how Germany and, and Britain are still into Warhammer when other places were not, or how certain games live on in certain countries in ways you wouldn't expect, like Call of Cthulhu is the biggest game in Japan. In Brazil... Lots of indie games in that sort of not Forge, but like early 2000s things like Mortal Coils. Do you remember that? <laughs> no, I do not. I no. do not remember that, but that is still a thing you can buy stuff for in Brazil. Um, there is a long running fanzine for White Wolf Street Fighter RPG. I saw that one day and I was like, what? Someone is still playing that? <laughs> I know, right. And it's actually it's a really good magazine. Like, If I had any interest in Street Fighter, I'd be really into it. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah that, so that's, but I think that's not specifically Brazilian. It's just one of, I happen to notice it because it's, it's in Brazil. But uh, yeah, I think other than that, it's pretty much like most places, with the exception that getting books to and around inside Brazil is a little tricky. Uh, like Accessibility is a problem. Getting polyhedral dice is quite difficult if you don't live in oh, wow. one of the major cities. I mean, like it was in when gaming started out everywhere. Right, so yeah, like for yeah. that reason, you see a lot of people using their wits and what's available to them to get their gaming fix in quite creative ways. Probably would take too long to go into specifics here but yeah that's uh interestingly a different ecosystem and it has uh its own version of like uh, the osr there's a game called old dragon that is i can't remember offhand what it's based on but it looks very red box D, &D. uh all the kind of mm. trade dress and stuff is really cool so if you get a chance to get those pdfs just google old dragon then like i guess rpg brazil but brazil has an s and then you should be able to find some of those pdfs and at least look, go look at the art and, and stuff uh run it through google translate i guess um, and you, awesome. you should, yeah. uh, should find some good stuff cool uh, Jesse's last question that's uh, a pretty good one if you were introducing the OSR to players new to gaming what mm. system and module would you use I'm going to discard the system part of it for myself I'm going to change the question to I'm just going to answer what I want to answer basically <laughs> <laughs> for story gamers if I was introducing the OSR to people who had never gamed at all I think it's really important to do a dungeon that's not just rats in the basement okay <laughs> like please do almost anything that's not just rats in the basement because i feel like as a culture we've moved on and absorbed enough fantasy pop we have enough fantasy pop culture stuff to where you can kind of do something a little crazier and more wild for a new group of people the witcher is mainstream television we've all been marinating in lord of the rings for 20 years i mean like there's you know i don't think it's the same as it was like in the 70s and 80s right? <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Uh, please just don't do something with rats in the basement or skeletons in the cave or whatever my specific recommendation is probably going to be um well i actually did do this with through ultan's door so that might be mm. a good i know that yeah. works because i recently did that uh i think something stinks in stilton would be a great choice yeah for a, 
because it has kind of like horror vibes as well. So I think that even if you get somebody who doesn't really know the fantasy stuff, they can at least latch on to the to the horror part of it, if nothing else. And the question that was not asked, but I think is a good one, is what if you were introducing the OSR to story gamers, what module would you use? And in that case, I would go with the very first one we covered, which is Scenic Dunsmith. Yeah, because I nice. think Scenic Dunsmith is a great example of like shattering the expectation of what people think the OSR is. I think Scenic Dunsmith does a great job of saying, no, it's not just a dungeon crawl. It can be this dark, grimy, southern, gothic-y mystery. Yeah, I mean, that's a great answer. I mean, my answer to a degree rejects the premise because as I just mentioned at some length, I run these open table games and we often have people show up who have never gamed before. Or sometimes like we go, so have you played a role playing game before? And they go, no. We go, have you sort of seen it done on YouTube? And they go, not really. We just sort of saw the thing in, in the internet and thought we tried out. So then we, you know, we give them the, the game as a conversation uh, spiel and then say, ah, don't worry, you'll see how it works when we get started. And yeah, the answer is it doesn't seem to matter that much as long as you are checking in and doing the right things to make sure they're following along all the time. It's OK. Like we had one player, she showed up completely unexperienced that week i was running troika it was a bit weird she ended up playing a clockwork centaur but it was fine that being said the ones i noticed worked pretty well include thousand thousand islands it was the one with the cat village what's that called mm. um, just look for the one with the picture of a cat on the front also winter's daughter these are yeah two we've not reviewed yet uh winter's daughter is pretty good it's uh not very fighty and uh has all this kind of fairy tale stuff going on in it oh, those are the ones that come to mind immediately but uh, yeah, generally speaking, as long as you can look at the premise of the adventure and it's not something that's kind of second order fantasy, I guess that's what we're thinking about is it needs to be something that's not D&D as a genre, but rather fantasy or, or horror or something as a genre, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, no, I love it. That's great. We don't have time to do all these questions, no, but uh, Tom, do you want to go through and pick another let's, one? Let's crack on and pick a few. Smithos, or Smythos, we'll never know, uh, writes... What aspects of thinking deeply about game design have transferred over to other parts of your lives? Oh, huh. Yeah, right? I don't... You know, for me, I don't... Oh, gosh. I, I don't know how to say this without sounding like a real prat, but, like, <laughs> <laughs> for, for me, role-playing games are are such an integral part of my life now professionally as well like i don't i don't know like how separable they are i guess um yeah so maybe that's not a great answer <laughs> well, no no like... i think it is an interesting answer i mean yeah i i sort of i know that some things have come from like my my ability to do conference calls at work has helped me run games on Google Hangouts, that kind of thing. But the other way, um, it's really hard because my first professional writing gig was on Feng Shui First Edition, I think. So, like, it's always been like things about kind of writing and, and layout and design and stuff have have always kind of been going. I think in both directions. Yeah. Um, in terms of game design, definitely, I have come to appreciate the value of an interesting choice to make starts to get a bit the theoretical and technical but yeah it, it kind of works but yeah it's really hard to separate like you say yeah it's tough i mean like i think um i just, i don't know like i just think like more than a lot of other people probably my life is tab is tabletop role playing games <laughs> so uh, yeah. it's kind of hard to make the separation you know yeah it's a, it's, a, it's a very good question, though, I think. So that's it's a why good I wanted question. To, yeah. Right, yeah. I don't think I have an answer to Yeah, yeah. Well, I, 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 <laughs> Your I'll answer was pretty good. I, I'm going to yeah. keep thinking about it, though, I think. So, yeah, thanks yeah. for that, Smith. Also. Yeah. All right. All right. Uh, I'll grab another one here. Kurufea, I guess, is the, is the mm -hmm. forum's name, asks, what tropes of OSR are essential to give the experience and which ones have been done to death and should be stopped immediately? Um my answer is the same for both, which is a long dead race of snake men. <laughs> uh, just kidding. It's bug people. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, oh, crumbs, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you have a real answer, though? I don't know if I do. No, no, I think bug people is it. Yeah. Okay. Let's move on. <laughs> uh, yes, they're, they're, it's both essential and time to move on. Let's see here. Sion Squeak. That's just, isn't that just Jay? Yeah, it's Jay. I just I don't know if we okay. should say his name on the podcast. <laughs> Asks, what's the most beautiful thing you've found in a dungeon? Yeah, I don't really have a good answer to this, except for the observation that the uh, the real beautiful thing that we discover in dungeons is friendship. Okay, I actually have my answer here is 
I'm going to talk about a, when I was thinking about this, I actually had in my life when I was younger, a real life dungeon. So my family has this house out in the country. We call it the country house. And it is essentially just a storage facility for like everyone's crap that they don't want to like keep around but also a place where we would all just like kind of scamper off to during the holidays to smoke pot and away from grandma (laughs) and so i remember though when i was younger being at the country house not smoking pot mind you but i was just there this thing is just piled up with like decades worth of my family's just crap right like just piles and piles of like crap that no one could be forced to get rid of and i remember finding a giant box of my uncle's old back issues of mad magazine nice yeah i must have spent like hours just going through all those old issues of mad magazine and it was so great because i just felt like i had this connection to my dad and his brothers that i didn't have before and um and stuck with me to this day i still have this like fondness for mad magazine and yeah so that's the most beautiful thing i found in dungeon fantastic good answer all right let's see um which of the osr modules you've discussed is your favorite oh wait i shouldn't have said that out loud now we have to choose a favorite child um (laughs) uh i can say yeah i'm trying to think oh yeah i know i know the answer i think there's a couple of contenders there um i think deep carbon observatory has got to be way up there secret of castro negro i'm gonna go with ravenloft though i think the original ravenloft module is my favorite of all the ones we've discussed it's just so perfectly constructed i mean everything about the original ravenloft module the pacing of it the structure of it the encounters it's all just a plus from beginning to end nice i think mine is a three-way tussle if not a tie between yeah secret of castro negro arguably not osr so mm. By the way, listeners, that's why we have the little get out. It only says old school in the intro. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so Secret of Castro Negro, definitely. I mean, I, I think, actually, no, yeah, it's that. That's the answer. My other two are like Death on the Reich and UVG. But no, Secret of Castro Negro. I mean, I can run it from memory. <laughs> it's, it's that. Yeah, good. that yeah. was my, that was definitely my second choice. That one and DCO were my, were my like kind of, yeah. those were my top three. Okay, so Judd, our friend Judd Carlman, asked, after looking at so many adventures, what are some principles of adventure design for adventures that you find well wrought? Uh, I have some thoughts here. Uh, I'll just go through them really quickly. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail because we've discussed it in other episodes. But 49 I think episodes. That, you can <laughs> yeah, I know. I like it when a module has a very strong introduction. I like when there is a consistent, recognizable theme throughout the adventure. I would love for there to be a general return to boxed text. Um, I think boxed text is one of the things that the older modules do really well that we've kind of don't do anymore. And I think we should get back to it because I think it's very helpful at the table. Flexible encounters and key locations, like uh, just the last one we talked about, Times That Fry, Men's Souls, that flexibility that was built into each of the keyed encounters was beautiful. I think loads of tables and closing matter that discusses where the adventure might go from here those are my big top line items nice i think a call for a return to box text might be the most controversial thing that's ever been said on this podcast well i have like a more abstract thing what i think yeah what i think unites the best of osr and story gaming and as i mentioned differentiates both from box ticking unplaytested mor game materials it is intentionality right like having an idea and designing your material to do that thing so yeah, like one of the examples is theme. We always bang on about themes on Fear of a Black Dragon. <laughs> it's, it's our, yeah. Because <laughs> it's one of the most obvious applications of intentional design, right? So my advice yeah. to the adventure designer is there are two options. Either know what you want your adventure to be about or to feel like before you start and keep going back during the process to make sure that you're doing that. Or if you're not sure yet and you just have like bubbling, you're just full of fizzing, popping ideas coming out everywhere that you need to write down, do that. But then take a step back every now and then to look at what's coming out of that free flow of creativity, like figure out what it is you're doing and see how you feel about the themes that are emerging and like what you could do to reinforce them or if they're not what you want to eliminate them. And then this is kind of important. You don't have to do like months and months of it, but do play test it to see if it actually works and does what you intend it to do when you get it to the table. And actually it might do something totally different and you might like that but at least this way you'll know. Awesome. This is from Droon Lord. Mm-hmm. Uh, what are your favorite OSR releases that you have not reviewed on Fear of a Black Dragon, Tom? 
I think I just mentioned them earlier. Yeah, so uh, the Thousand Thousand Islands zines, there are four of them uh, by uh, ZXU with art by Mung Kao. And uh, Winter's Daughter, which is from the Dolmenwood mm-hmm. setting. Uh, I ran that recently. That was really good. Uh, yeah, I think we hopefully we can get some episodes about those fairly soon. Yeah, I'd love to do some Dolmenwood stuff, period, at some point. Mm-hmm. There's so many, though, here for me. Uh, Veins of the Earth, um, Lauren's Song of the Bachelor. Some of the stuff from Morkborg looks pretty cool. Um, yeah, those are mine. Those are just a few, but there's so many. Gosh. Yeah. This is another question that Drew Lord asked. Are there any upcoming OSR projects that you are excited about? Hmm. You go first. I noticed we both have You Got a Job on the Garbage Barge. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's by Amanda Lee Frank, who, a full disclosure, Amanda is the cover artist for Codex, but this is we, we don't have any involvement with You Got a Job on the Garbage Barge, which looks amazing. Okay, yeah. I'm also looking forward to Shadow of Mog, which is a recently kickstarted post Brexit apocalyptic setting. Mm. <laughs> and uh, The Driftwood Verses by uh, designed by Clint Krauss, which is a gloomy nautical OSR setting, which, uh, yeah, it's a little bit behind schedule, I think it's fair to say, but uh, I'm, yeah, I'm looking forward to it when it arrives. Eric Vulgaris asks, what OSR adventure or module do you wish you could experience for the first time again? This is a good question. This is a good question. Since I'm mostly a GM and I run things over and over again, I do get to experience them <laughs> again <laughs> frequently. But having said that, I really love one of the under, more under the radar selections is the Croaking Fane, one of the DCC modules. The Croaking Fane deserves to be more beloved than it is i think it is so wonderfully humorous but also gross and beautifully structured from a to z just every beat of that is so good and the reason why it sticks out in my memory is i remember the first time i ran it i don't think i've ever been in a play group this was a face-to-face group where we just were laughing and having such a good time like it was just pure joy playing the croaking fane so that's one of mine i would also say the second section of Dead Planet, the first time I ran that, which is, that's the Cannibal Moon section. The Cannibal Moon, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, so good. It was just a really prime experience. Please go see the episode on Dead Planet. <laughs> yeah. I mean, for me, I, I yeah, I struggled to think what this would be, because I guess the answer in a way is all of them. But then I realized, as much as I enjoyed GMing Death on the Reich, it's to my eternal regret that I'll never be able to be that player and experience, especially that whole crazy gothic castle with... as you were in a castle weren't you <laughs> like ah oh, it's it seemed like the players were having a really good time and i wanted to join them is what i'm saying yeah death on the reich i think yeah that's awesome do you want to pick another one maybe a last one here blake ryan asks what was the game that changed the way you play or run for the better made you stop and go hang on i get it now we can play a much better game from now on oh dungeon world hands down for me Dungeon World completely changed my whole outlook on role-playing games. I mean, 100%, particularly fantasy role-playing games. In the world before Dungeon World, I thought that combat always had to take an hour. <laughs> I thought yeah. that it only made sense for the GM to also roll dice. Like, there's, I mean, I'm being a little reductive, but like, nothing has altered my gaming landscape like Dungeon World did. And I, I don't play Dungeon World anymore, to be honest, because I've kind of moved on to other things. But it was a completely seminal game-changing thing for me when apocalypse world came out a lot of people were kind of writing is this i don't don't get it this doesn't this is like too obscure it's deliberately written badly what's what's this baker guy thinking but the reason i I read it and i immediately was like oh yeah yeah no this is it this is i get this and the reason for that is my answer to this question which is unknown armies which when i got the first edition it really blew me away with uh not just the cute dice tricks which are also pretty good this idea of loading more information into each mechanical role but just this idea of a fully destructible world with like these huge npcs you know some of whom are in charge of world spanning conspiracies but who are designed to be in the crosshairs and get the total opposite of the iconic characters from vampire the masquerade and stuff that were current at the time and yeah so unknown armies like greg stoltzy and john tynes was my watershed game in in like how i gm and i and play well as well it also was full of really good stuff for players and embracing kind of not play to lose, but like play for other goals than just some kind of financial or personal dominance over the world around you. <laughs> right. Yeah. I think it's really fascinating that like, as I think you can probably ask anyone and they're going to have like that little moment for them, like when yeah. a game that arrived at a certain time in their gaming career, you know, for a lot of people, 
in more recent years, that's going to be Blades in the Dark. Like sure. Blades in the yeah. Dark is going to be that game that people name. I hope someday the trophy is that game for some people. I love that kind of discussion. I wish we could talk about this longer. That understanding your relationship to games like that, I think is very, very good to do. It's very fascinating. Let's go to companion adventures. Yeah, sure. So for companion adventures, we just wanted to talk a little bit about the future of Fear of a Black Dragon. Tom, I know you have some ideas. Yeah, so uh, one of the things Jason and I have been discussing between episodes is the idea of keeping it old school, but also looking at genres beyond fantasy. One of the difficulties we realized is that if you start looking at things like traveler style science fiction or, say, cyberpunk from the like 90s, it's quite difficult to just like pick one module that could be dropped mm-hmm. into a campaign. It's like, yeah. So we're sort of thinking about how to best approach that, like maybe doing little mini strands of, like, yeah, this is yeah. three or four episodes about space stuff, and this is yeah, three yeah. episodes of Cyberpunk. But yeah, we're still trying to figure out the best format to do that, but that might happen. I mean, yeah, I guess it's old school. Is okay. I think a lot of the Cyberpunk ones might be about seeing how old school turned into modern mainstream gaming frankly because i think that's the transition <laughs> right, point yeah. isn't it like around, i suspect that will be a lot yeah, of it yeah 96 or something yeah mm. i mean i mean when we did arasaka brainworm that's basically what the conversation was right? oh, it was yeah. like yeah. it's like look how things have changed <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> aren't we so much better now <laughs> yeah <laughs> are we yes yes I'm sure. <laughs> uh, yeah i think that's interesting i think science fiction is a great way to go i know we're really interested in looking at modules that were written in other languages for example i know the dark eye is something that we are trying to figure out how to make that work the problem is many of the classic modules for the dark eye for example have not had english translations or good ones and so um my german is very rusty yeah and, and if i <laughs> do the translation <laughs> it, won't, it won't be that good so that's an issue we might need to get in some outside help on that one yeah although i think one of the topics i want to tackle is this i should make clear i don't speak german so one of the things i would like to explore is this idea of how you can make use of material as in languages you don't actually speak particularly well mm-hmm. or even at all and that is a thing I, I have found is possible so that's definitely a topic we should we should look at yeah any other thoughts about the future of fear of a black dragon i know one thing we're definitely not going to do some people ask people ask this all the time and listeners it's just not going to happen we're not looking at system so that's just not gonna yeah be that's, that's true <laughs> many people ask us to look at system and we're just not doing it it's not what our show's about yeah that's Sorry not to gonna burst happen. Your bubble. i mean although uh, yeah, one thing uh, one thing i am kind of interested in, in exploring more i think we've touched on it a bit in the past is what you could call medium specific practices for the table so like things you can only do if you're gaming online or things you can only do face to face if you look up i've forgotten where it was i think it's on uh, the bastion land blog something about like alien martial arts for uh, into the odd at the time and electric bastion land now and the, these martial arts are full of ludicrous stuff like make a stack of d6s and then throw your d20 at it and then like they fall <laughs> on the table you know so like you you can never do it online and it's it's kind of stupid but yeah like that kind of concept of like what could we do in ways that take advantage of unique circumstances yeah that i yeah. think would be interesting yeah I and i think some of the titles we've got coming up in our pipeline afford us the opportunity to do that i think something that we kind of started to do a little bit in some of the episodes which i'd like to expand on more is we did a few episodes that were talking about specific geographies and like how to run games specific to those sorts of uh, yeah, like, like fever swamp and stuff yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, right exactly i'd like to explore that a little bit more like maybe do a run of episodes that like focus on a particular type of adventure maybe seafaring maybe maybe make that we make that a goal we try to find the good try to find a good seafaring, <laughs> good adventure. seafaring module so, yeah. i don't know but it, that's just an idea i mean honestly for the most part i think our format is pretty good and i think yeah. the way we're doing it is pretty good and we're only 50 episodes in yeah but you know that said we'll play with things a little bit here and there but it's still going to be at its core the same show all right wouldn't want any other way I just want to end by telling you, Tom, that I'm so delighted that we got to 50 episodes yeah. and it has been a wonderful pleasure and privilege uh, working on the show with you. I really, truly like so many things I do in the gauntlet end up feeling a lot like work <laughs> you know, and like things I don't want to do. But Fear of a Black Dragon is not one of those things. I genuinely love preparing for this show. Um, I don't always love reading 200-page 
Warhammer. Oh my god, Jason, <laughs> look, there's only two more books to go, and then we will have achieved the <laughs> unprecedented feat of actually reviewing all of the enemy within, all right? It's gonna be it's gonna be good, I promise. I definitely did not love Warlock of Firetop Mountain, but I do in general, uh I really love the work <laughs> that we do for this show, and I love sitting down with you every week or a couple weeks or so and chatting about games. It's been a real highlight for me. So I just wanted yeah. to say that. Well well thanks, Jason. Yeah, it's uh, the same for me. I it never feels like work, um, which I think we can probably tell when we open up our share Google Doc and realize that the other person has written like a small book about of notes. <laughs> like clearly this <laughs> is just, not. We should just release all of our notes one day. That's a that's a gold mine for people, yeah. honestly, because the notes are a lot more extensive than what we actually talk about. But yeah, yeah. Although I mean, hmm, uh, is that okay? Well, yeah, maybe, let's yeah. Well, let's discuss that. <laughs> maybe yeah, not mine. Like, mine, yeah. mine are so listeners. Here, my notes are a script. I literally script out everything I'm going to say, more or less. Tom's are not. Tom's, I, Tom, I feel like yours, Tom, are a lot more like, are like actual proper notes that could like go in a hundred different directions. Yeah, although sometimes that becomes apparent as I'm uh, going through them. But yeah, uh, let's, uh, <laughs> yeah, it has. It's been a pleasure, Jason. Thank you so much for being the perfect podcasting partner, basically. I feel like you're right that the chemistry was there since day one on that weird actual play thing we did and uh <laughs> it's actually it's really good we should li- we should link to that actual play it's actually it's really good. enjoyable yeah yeah and uh yeah so yeah thanks to you and i guess this is the the wrapping up with thanks bit so let's also thanks to paul and to luke and uh and to rich who i believe is editing this episode so uh, and rich actually so, yeah. even even when not the editor has been a an ongoing supporter and like yeah Mm-hmm. There with advice and help all along as well. I mean, so, yeah. Rich Rogers is the the keystone of the whole podcasting, <laughs> the whole Gauntlet that podcast a, network. That's right? actually true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, like yeah. it, it just like I don't think any of it would happen without Rich Rogers. So, yeah. uh, so thanks to to Rich as well. Yeah, well, I think that's I think that's all we got, uh, listeners. That was our fiftieth episode. Fear of Black Dragon is a production of the Gauntlet. We are on Twitter at Gauntlet RPG. We have a website. It's gauntlet-rpg.com. We're on Patreon. If you'd like to support the show, go to patreon.com forward slash gauntlet and throw us a couple bucks there. Tom, thanks. Thank you, Jason. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Hi listeners, there has never been a better time to get into online role-playing games than right now, and The Gauntlet is one of the best places to give it a shot. We've been organizing and running hundreds of game sessions each year since 2015, and we're always happy to welcome new players. Today I want to talk about two things, Gauntlet Hangouts and Gauntlet Community Open Gaming. Gauntlet Hangouts is our regular weekly game schedule, where players and game runners come together to run the best indie tabletop role-playing games around. Right now, we have a limited number of $10 spots available on our Patreon. These $10 spots are the best way to get involved with Gauntlet Hangouts because they give you RSVP priority for new Gauntlet Hangouts game sessions. These $10 spots also come with the regular benefits of Gauntlet membership, a Codex magazine, access to our Slack group, and you help keep podcasts like this one going. But you need to act fast. There are only 35 of these $10 spots available for calendar year 2020. The other thing I want to talk about is Gauntlet Community Open Gaming. Gauntlet Community Open Gaming is a special weekend of gaming we have put together to help support folks who are trapped in the house because of coronavirus. The first Gauntlet Community Open Gaming weekend is April 16th through April 19th. This special event is completely free. Anyone can join up and play, and features an amazing lineup of games, from Hearts of Wulin, to Trophy, to Pasión de las Pasiones, and much more. To learn more about Gauntlet Hangouts and Gauntlet Community Open Gaming, head over to our website, gauntlet-rpg.com. Thanks. Oh, hey, Tom, before we go. Mm -hmm. So, I've been thinking, 50 episodes might be a great opportunity to have a little Mm rebrand. Fear of a Black Dragon is kind of a crap name. Do you have any ideas for alternatives? I'm glad you've asked me about this, Jason, because it, it's been a while since you've entertained this uh, this possibility. So I've been working on a on a few options. Sh- shall I run a, a few of them past you? Please do. Okay. I'll, I'll give you a um a score from one to ten for each one. Go for it. Okay. All hail the queen of the demon web pits. <laughs> what? Okay. No. Next. Paul's Bodak. <laughs> 
think it's that's a seven at least, right? Yeah, it's yeah, good, right? Pretty good. Uh, yeah, pretty good. Nine one one is a choker. <laughs> That's that's a nine, right? That's Great. good. That's pretty good. Uh, yeah, that's good. I've got a few more. Hang in there. Uh, uh, please do. Yeah. I left my Wemmick in El Segundo. <laughs> oh, uh, six. Six. Um, six. Oh yeah, it's a six. Come I on. mean, it peters out after this. Efreet Schoolyard. <laughs> no. 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 <laughs> pretty much out at this point. <laughs> uh, I guess we're stuck with Fear of a Black Dragon. I guess we are. <laughs>